Hi, I'm 8-Pack, and I'm here to talk about the new 8700K, codenamed Coffee Lake CPU, just launched by Intel, and the platform that the new CPU uh, plugs into or performs on is the Z370. So you'll see a whole new range of Z370 motherboards available to support the CPU. Please don't plug the CPU into any older motherboards like Z270 or Z170, as it simply, as it simply will not work. Now let's discuss quickly a little bit about stock overclocking uh, with this CPU. The 8700K CPU overclocking the core is, is very similar to 7700K in terms of what you can expect. Overclocking the cache is higher on the 8700K by three or four bins than the 7700K. And the IMC, or the Integrated Memory Controller, on the 8700K is also very similar to the 7700K. So on a four DIMM board, you're looking at a limit of around 3866 MHz for 24 7 stability. And on a two DIMM board, such as the Apex, you can go up to 4133, 4266 for 24 7 stability, depending on the IMC. But in all honesty, the overclocking of this CPU is very similar across the board, apart from cache to the 7700K CPU. A while ago, speculation on the forums mounted about this CPU and I asked for some uh, customer feedback on what questions they wanted answered initially in this video. So I'm just going to answer two or three of these questions first. One of the questions was, yeah, of course, Coffee Lake has six cores, 12 threads, so an extra two cores and four threads to the previous generation 7700K CPU, but how are these extra cores and threads performing in terms of IPC? So to test this, I got a 7700K, set it to one core and two threads on an ASUS motherboard, I also got an 8700K, set it to one core and two threads uh, again on a, a SUS board, and I wanted to check so the, the IPC, so I set them at the exact same clocks. So let's first look at this and see how the performance is different between the two CPUs, or indeed if it's just similar. So here, here we have, uh, I'm comparing uh, Cinebench R15 actually, but across the board, all the results were very similar. So in R15, this was the Coffee Lake, and you can see how one core, two threads, 4.7, 4.3, with the XMP 8-pack sticks, 3200C14. And we saw a score of 271 Cinebench points for that single-threaded test. Similarly, in Terragon, single thread, the time was 18 minutes 51. Again, with one core, two threads, uh, and this was on the the Coffee Lake CPU. So 18 minutes 51, that's a fairly long test. Over to the Cable Lake, and we see for the Terragon, we have 18 minutes 52. So the difference in actual IPC between the two generations of CPU seems to me to be exactly the same in this test. Now let's check on Cinebench. Cinebench again, same frequencies, and 272. So that's exactly the same score. And I did this also for Firestrike, uh, a gaming test, uh, and also RealBench. And there was no statistical difference between the performance of the two CPUs. So to answer the forum's question is, the IPC of the, of the 7700K and the 8700K in all my testing has shown to be exactly the same. The main benefit, of course, is the 8700K has two cores and four extra threads to utilize. So not only for gaming, uh, you can game while, while uh, streaming at the same time. You can use all threads for content creation. You can use them for photography work or rendering, all this kind of stuff. So the extra two threads, uh, two cores, four threads are making a real benefit where you need real CPU power. But in terms of IPC, it's exactly the same. Another question I was asked on the forum is, how is memory speed affecting performance? So I did a little bit of testing at 3200, 3600, uh, and 3866 memory speeds. And let's just check out those results. So this here is the 3200 megahertz, five gigahertz on the CPU, 4.8 on the cache, and you've got uh, 1640. This is the 3600 testing, and you've got 1648. So going from 3,200 to 3,600, you've got like six extra points there. 
and then going all the way up to 4,000, you've got a further four points. So what we can see really is the overclocking of the memory is not having a, a great deal of effect on our score on Cinebench. And also, obviously, for time constraints, I did test as well in gaming, TerraGen, RealBench, uh, and such benchmarks, and I found that the same. I mean, if, if, if you are deciding to really push your memory high uh, on this particular platform, uh, you obviously also need not only to tune the primary timing, but tune the lower timings to get maximum benefit, because obviously the motherboards on XMP are slackening off the lower timings to ensure stability. Okay, so now we've discussed a little bit uh, about memory and we've discussed about IPC. Let's just check out the stock performance of the CPU. So the stock testing, stock Firestrike, which is a game simulation bench, we've got 22.410, with the CPU clocked at stock with the memory XMP3200. And the R15 stock test, 14.51 Cinebench points, Again, completely at stock. Okay, so the next question I was asked was, how, what, how much overclocking can I get out of an everyday air cooler? So take, for example, the Cooler Master Hyper. The overclocking of the CPUs is obviously dependent on the quality of the silicon, the voltage that you can apply to gain stability, and the overall cooling or temperature limit. And what I found was that obviously, the, the main thing is the quality of the silicon. But, but with these CPUs, uh, for that particular cooler, the maximum voltage you could apply to gain stability is around 1.225 or 1.23 volts. So not much overclocking headroom on the voltage. Uh, and that, when you ran stress tests, the temperature's well over 80C, maybe mid 80s to late 80s. So on the lower end air cooler, you were looking on your average CPU around 4.7 to 4.8 gigahertz. If you went up to the AIO cooler, the 240, uh, again, on the stock tim, you were talking about uh, a voltage to gain stability of about 1.275 to 1.285. And at those voltages, again, the temperature when running non AVX Prime or real bench, something really stressing the CPU out was in the mid 80s, and obviously you wouldn't want to go higher. And it were, with those kind of voltages, you were talking about uh, 4.8 to 4.9 absolute maximum uh, on the core, uh, memory at pretty much stock. Uh, and the cash ratio also at stock. So, I mean, how, how else can you obviously improve uh, on your overclocking? Well, the main thing to improve on the overclocking on these CPUs is to give, uh, be able to use more voltage to stabilize and obviously uh, a better TIM to, to control the temperatures. And that's what we do here at OC UK. We're doing, uh, offering a service with binning and deleting of the CPUs. Uh, I mean, I've got some uh, delidin results here, but for those who don't know what delidin is, it's basically removing the IHS of the CPU and changing the thermal interface that's between the die of the CPU and the IHS. And we're using uh, Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut because that is the best or the market leader at the moment, especially in terms of uh, thermal cycles. It can last way longer than any competitor on the market. Okay, so let's see how our CPUs have benefited uh, from delidin. Here we've got the, the non delidded CPU first. So 4.9, 1.35 volts on the core, 4.4, uh, which is uh, the stock cache frequency and 3200. And as you can see, the peak temperature is 96 on the CPU here, okay? So we did the same thing, and this was on a 240 IO cooler. We did the same thing then with the delidded unit, and what we saw was, uh, again, after half an hour of non-AVX Prime, 1.36 volts, 4.9, 4.4, again XMP, our top temperature was 71C. So we'd literally lost 25 degrees C by performing the delidin procedure. And what this gives us is extra voltage uh, to gain stability when overclocking. I can even show here uh, a 5 gigahertz overclock but this time with, with 1.4 volts, which is considerably more uh, voltage, and the temperatures are still less at, by uh, around 20C than the stock turn. So it really does give us uh, voltage headroom. 
And I'd suggest when overclocking these CPUs, if you're using uh, decent quality cooling and you have a delidered uh, bin CPU that up to 1.425 is fine and your temperatures will still be well within the acceptable range. Even running something like non-AVX Prime here for extended periods or real bench or any non-AVX application. Okay, so I'm proud to say that here at OCUK, from launch we are going to be offering uh, delidered and binned 8700K CPUs. All of them will have the tin, uh, the tin changed so you can take advantages of, of these great temperatures. Now let's look at some performance results from the bin CPUs, which will be available in 5 gigahertz and 5.1 gigahertz bin. Uh, with obviously, with these CPUs, we do require the end user to have a high-end Z370 board, so something like an Asus Maximus 10 Hero or uh, ASRock Tai Chi or a Gigabyte Gaming 7, something of that level. But And also, the minimum cooling is uh, AIO 240 for obvious reasons, the cooling is going to help with the stability. Now let's look at some performance improvements from the delidding and obviously inc increasing, uh, increasing core frequency. So this is our 5 gigahertz Simony Bench R15 result, and we're talking 1640 uh, Cinebench points. Now this, these temperatures here are actually this with very high SA and IO, as in over 1.2, so we can run high memory, uh, and after half an hour at least of AVX Prime. So these are not the temperatures you can expect under Cinebench load. It's probably going to be around 70. But we've got uh, 1640 there from the bin CPUs. And from the stock performance, we've got 1451. So that's quite a big uh, jump in R15. And what you can expect, obviously, from the bin CPUs is a similar jump in performance uh, com uh, compared to the stock CPU in every single application that you try. If you want to buy these CPUs, obviously go to www.overclockers.co.uk. If you have any questions about the video or want any further information, hit our forums. And that's about all from me. Thanks for watching.